All right, so this is the first webinar in a series that we're trying to run, I mean, we are running, called Global Views of COVID-19. And today, the opening one, we're doing some responses and perspectives in China, Taiwan, and Italy. This is a collaboration between me here at Arias and Richard, who is going to introduce himself in a minute, at the East Asia National Resource Center at George Washington University. I'm at UC Berkeley. Um, and this slide deck, along with the recording, will be available afterward. Okay, so our agenda here, we're going to do a quick intro and overview. You actually have uh, a sh small number, one, two, three, oh, I just realized that we actually have two, Hua Yingbao and Qing Yun Li are actually doing separate presentations now. Um, we're doing an intro, we're going to have a series of very short presentations. During the presentations, you can write your questions in the chat bar. Richard and Shruti will be um, keeping track of those. And then after that, they will pose them in a Q&A. So the first thing, just to do an intro here for ourselves, so you know who we are. I'm Shane Carter. I'm the program coordinator at Orias. Orias is, uh, stands for the uh, Office of Resources for International and Area Studies. I do K-12 and community college outreach to teachers on behalf of the eight area studies centers at UC Berkeley. So I work almost entirely with teachers. I also am part of a consortium on campus here called UC Berkeley Professional Development Providers. And we are a group of people who do PD across disciplines and we're sort of housed under the Graduate School for Education. And we've been doing a series of different webinars in response to what teachers seem to be needing right now. Um, and interested in. And so you can check at the end, I'll share resources with you for that. And Richard? Uh, great, so uh, just a brief introduction then. Uh, so my name's Richard Haddock. Uh, I am with George Washington University's East Asia National Resource Center, one of the uh, Title VI NRCs. Uh, and we focus specifically on East Asia uh, and Northeast Asia uh, as well. Uh, and what we try to do, what my job is, is kind of the uh, program manager of the uh, Title VI project. So it's uh, all encompassing with uh, elements of uh, events for the public, uh, a, events and research for uh, visiting scholars. In fact, all the speakers today are visiting scholars with the National Resource Center. That's one of the really great programs that uh, we're able to support. And uh, we also have, uh, it, we're starting off with, but we have some very great partners uh, with our K through 12 outreach uh, and our curriculum developer, Shruti, who is uh, joining us today as a co-host and will be helping me uh, oversee the uh, questions and answers. Uh, she and our team have uh, really tried to create uh, portable lesson plans that can help uh, instructors teach about East Asia with a focus on contemporary issues. So uh, if there's pieces on the news. Certainly this administration has uh, no shortage of uh, news pieces uh, out there. So we're trying to uh, make these education materials to provide context to instructors and students alike about what's going on in East Asia. And we have a few podcast uh, series uh, coming up soon, uh, but don't want to take uh, further attention away from our scholars who uh, I'm very interested to see what everyone will have to say about this. And I'm sure everyone uh, has been following this as it's been impacting our communities. Uh, in fact, just today, uh, Virginia got the uh, stay at home order. So I'm looking forward to see how uh, this has shaped uh, Asia, how countries in Asia and Italy have responded to this and maybe what are some lessons learned for us to take away. I just wanna um, also say one final thing, especially for the teachers who are on the call. This isn't meant to be instrumental, in other words, um, you're welcome to share the video with your students afterward. We certainly hope that you're going to share the information and bring it into your conversations with them. But we also understand this isn't necessarily intended to just turn into a lesson for you. It's really because you are information providers for them and we want you to have a broader understanding of what's happening with the COVID-19 pandemic globally. I think it's really helpful to, um, to be able to understand it in this, you know, in a worldwide sense, so. Yeah, so uh, Ms. Huang Bao is the Chief of Division for International Exchange at the International Exchange and Cooperation Office at the Beijing Foreign Studies University, where she focuses on comparative cultural diplomacy and immigration. 
uh, at RNRC. She's studying cultural exchange and strategies between China and the United States and how to improve uh, Sino-US relations in that regard. Uh, actually, one uh, interesting uh, tidbit as well is that she has uh, recently uh, published an article, was it about a month ago, uh, on The Diplomat, uh, kind of discussing uh, coronavirus situation spread at the time and how, uh, how can US-China relations uh, move forward uh, in that. And she's actively publishing and very much looking forward to hearing her thoughts. So please welcome Huang Bao. Today I would like to share, you, share with you China's experiences on combating COVID-19 and the disease impact on China. Uh, so first I will share with you the updates of the COVID-19 situation in China, and then China's measures in combating COVID-19, and then uh, COVID-19's economic impact on China, and also its impact on China as a global power. That means China's relationship with the, the world. And uh, finally, it's a conclusion. Okay, this is the outline just now already introduced to the audience. And then, can you show the next page? Okay. Okay, first I'll share with you the COVID-19 case update. Uh, in March, actually, there has been a period in China that China's increased case, cases almost dropped to zero with only imported cases from abroad. And now the increased cases in China has been contained in a very low level. And till yesterday, till yesterday the increased cases in China is 31, among which 30 are imported cases from abroad. And there's only one domestic uh, case in China. And also, uh, with this very well containment of the coronavirus, China's businesses and industries nowadays gradually recover. And also, China began to share its experiences and replies to the world. Can you turn to the next page? Okay, thank you. So let's see what measures did China adopt in overcoming this COVID-19 virus. Uh, although China is the first country of uh, outbreak and uh, one of the most heavily countries in the world, but China now is considered as one of the most successful countries in bad virus. Um, let's see what matters did China adopt. First, China shut off the Wuhan city in the first time in, in, at the very beginning and adopted a very strict domestic travel policy. And second, China, there has been an all-in engagement of the whole society in the anti-virus campaign. So our central government, our military, our government agencies, hospitals, and numerous local community employees and volunteers have joined this, what we call a people's war. And third, there's incredibly high efficiency on producing medical supplies and uh, medical supplies. As you heard that the two hospitals in Wuhan have been established. So as you know, at the beginning, we also felt a part of masks. This soon was resolved. China can produce seven times facial masks before. Per month. So in um, and uh, the fourth is the high technology. Th high technology uh, play a very important role uh, during the pandemic. Within seven days, China has separated the virus strain and shared its information to the world. And also as a Huyang, we just lost your audio. Can you repeat that? Okay. I think I lost you. I think I lost you. Yeah, now you're back. I'm, I'm back again. Okay, yeah. okay. Okay, let's continue. And also, China's advanced information technology has played a very essential role in maintaining 
a smooth operation of the society. The IT has helped with temperature screening, logistics, food delivery, online education, online medical consultation, etc. And uh, the quarantine, uh, quarantine of the whole public in China to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. All Chinese people voluntar voluntarily and cooperatively take self-quarantine at home during the pandemic. Can you hear me in the normal way? Can you hear uh, me? Yeah, mostly. Yep. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, uh, Richard, can you turn to the next page? Yeah, yeah just in the uh, interest of time, uh, maybe start uh, kind of wrapping up the main bullet points. Okay, so I will summarize that the China model as a whole of government, a whole of society approach. That means it's a unified action of the whole society under a strong and efficient leadership of the government. It is a conscious and a rational participation and involvement of the general public. Okay, can you turn to the next page? Okay, now uh, our analysis analyzed the economic impact of COVID-19 on China. Um, COVID-19 does have very severe strike on China's economy, especially during January and February. This can be shown in official st economic uh, statistics by China uh, government. Due to time limit, I will not list in details. And China's economy has also begun to gradually recover. There is an optimistic view that by releasing economic repression during the pandemic, China will have a very expected rebound of economy in the latter half of the year. Can you turn to Next page. Okay, and uh, let's let's look at the positive impact of uh, COVID nineteen on China as a global power, uh, with remarkable achievement in this anti pandemic. It's believed to demonstrate its the strength of its system, its sense of solidarity among its people. So in the world, um, it has been. Uh, to provide medical assistance and share its experience to the world with the world. So with all this, China has gained recognition and appreciation from the world. Like Dr. Chandos, WHO Director General, Matt Hancock, which is Secretary of Health, and the Minister of Health, and the Serbian President, they all express appreciation for China. So in interview, can you turn to the next page? In the interview with British media, the Mr. Liu Xiaoming, the ambassador, or Chinese ambassador to UK, proudly announced that China has demonstrated a responsible global player to the world. Okay, next page. Let's look at the negative Im impact. There has been uh, criticism from the international community about China's way in responding to this virus. The delayed response against the pandemic outbreak in Wuhan at the initial stage, followed by the death of the whistleblower, Dr. Li Wenliang, uh, has been seen as a deliberate cover-up of the Chinese government and also been pandemic all over. No one has been suspicion. There has always been suspicion of a violent human rights on the cut-off action of the lockdown of Wuhan city. In present, uh, next page, President Donald Trump, uh, uh, referring to this pandemic as a China virus, filled up against the Chinese people all over the world. And there's also some American politicians predicted a synthesis of the world supply chain followed by the pandemic. That means a return of the production plants from China back to US or other places of the world. So China has been providing aid to the world. Some countries doubt that China's mask diplomacy is a skill to compensate for its cause of the pandemic. And by showing a positive, generous image of China, uh, uh, image, uh, the chance for the leadership of the world. And next page. Okay, so finally, amid this COVID 19 pandemic, China seems to set up a responsible set of an image as a responsible rising power in the world. But there has always been uh, challenges and criticism. COVID 19 is still rampant. 
changing across the world, it is already on its way to reshape our world. We don't yet know when this crisis will end, but what we can foresee is by the time it does, our world will look quite different. Thank you. Due to time limit, I have to speak in very brief. I hope we can communicate more in, in Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have uh, Dr. Qingyun Li, Associate Research Professor of Chinese Politics at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. Her areas of expertise are on the theory and practice of socialism with Chinese characteristics, as well as the history of the Chinese Communist Party. And she's been a uh, non-resident scholar with the George Washington University before, and we're very happy that she's able to uh, be an NRC-related scholar. Uh, and I think that you'll have a lot of interesting elements to say, this time commenting on uh, Huang uh, talked about kind of the structural responses and the state society responses. And uh, Dr. Lee will speak more to the uh, culture, organizational culture, societal culture that uh, kind of uh, goes in between these uh, state and society structures. So uh, Dr. Lee, please. Uh, I'm glad to be here to share my views with all of you. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, I will talk about uh, what the domestic cultural norms in China contribute to the country's response in addressing the lower coronavirus spread. Next slide. Um, there are uh, four cultural norms uh, uh, which contributed. Uh, Chinese tradition, culture, China's social ethic order, the red culture, red gene, Call socialist values. Next slide, please. Uh, so first, um, Chinese uh, Chinese traditional culture, whose core content is um, Confucianism, is deeply ingrained in Chinese society and deeply affects psychologically the Chinese people. Chinese tradition culture advocates the consciousness of every person is responsible for the rise and fall of the world and emphasize love and loyalty to the country. Confucianism also emphasizes respect for authority, social stability, and national interests over individualism. These core beliefs are most evident when the country is in crisis. Most Chinese people trust their government. They are willing to obey authority. They are willing to obey state control, and they are willing to sacrifice their in individual freedom in exchange for security, uh, stability, and the unity of the society and the country. These cultural characteristics note the government slow down and the state and home order to be widely observed and better enforced with civilian participation. Second, China's social ethic order. Chinese society has a profound belief that everyone is a family and the entire society is a big family. And the moment of their countryman's crisis, tens of thousands of people, including doctors, nurses from all over the country volunteered to go to Wuhan to help. Many people went to Wuhan to help those in danger, while at the same time risking their own lives. The sense of national identity and cohesion makes Chinese people willing to live and die together, share difficulties, and fight against the coronavirus together. That was why there are so many volunteers to help in front lines. Third, the red cultural red gene. The Red Culture was formed during the Chinese Revolution. The Red Culture cultivated different revolutionary strains in different uh, historical uh, periods, such as the Red Boat Sprint, Jingangshan Sprint, Nong March Sprint, Yan An Sprint, and so on. These sprints all advocate the loyalty to the country, the confidence of overcoming difficulties, the heroic spirit of willing the world, the sacrificial spirit, and the concept of military eye discipline, and so on. The Red Culture built the modern Chinese spirit, values, and power, while also providing spiritual guidance for the Chinese people. The top-down system based on this Red Culture 
played a decisive role in the fight against the coronavirus. It made the central government handle enough strong power to dispatch national resources in response to coronavirus and to maintain social stability. Party members also actively participate in the prevention and the control of the coronavirus. And the party's organization became the anti-coronavirus command center. Fourth, core socialist values. Chinese society is now a society led by socialist core values, which are the mainstream values of the present-day Chinese society and the people. The core socialist values are the concentrated embodiment of the contemporary Chinese spirit and the ideological and the moral basis of Chinese power. The Chinese government calls on the people to practice the core socialist value, to reflect these values of the state in society and in individuals. These values guide all the aspect of moral construction. Guided by the core socialist value, Chinese people have faith, country has strength, and the nation has hope. This has promoted the normal operation of a society and can guarantee effective handling and the resolution of a social crisis. In conclusion, I want to say, uh, virus have no borders. Only cooperation can defeat the virus. Mutual assistance is the form of human civilization. China will assume uh, the responsibility of a great power and do its best to help others. Thanks for having me. And uh, if there's any questions regarding the other slides, uh, feel free to include them in the chat box and follow up in Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Li. Uh, and now to introduce uh, Dr. Eve Cho. Uh, Dr. Cho is a Fulbright grantee and CEO of the Foundation for Excellent Journalism Award in Taiwan, which awards prizes to outstanding journalists annually for improving the quality of news media in Taiwan. And uh, she came in, uh, actually many of our scholars, uh, when they joined and didn't anticipate uh, a crisis of this scale. Uh, so everyone has been uh, very admirable in uh, trying to conduct their research uh, remotely and uh, doc, Dr. Cho just came in when this started, but uh, still she's made a uh, pretty good impact. So looking forward to hearing her chat. Uh, Dr. Cho, please take it away. Hey, uh, hi everyone. Nice to meet you on screen. I'm Yip Chu from Taiwan. Now I'm going to share the experiences of Taiwan and how is uh, Taiwan dealing with this uh, virus? Uh, please see the sky one. Uh, next one, please. Uh, you can see from the slide one, some, uh, I have to do some short breaks. Uh, it's necessary for paving the context of this uh, narrative. Uh, Taiwan is uh, 130 uh, kilometers from China. You can see from the map. Taiwan Strait is in between and more than uh, 400,000 Taiwanese people working in mainland China, not including many students and tourists, uh, flow frequently across the strait. Therefore, Taiwan was predicted to be one of the hardest hit uh, location of the uh, novel, uh, novel coronavirus pandemic. Although the following scenery is uh, quite another story. Uh, slide two, please. On March 30, uh, there are 306 virus cases of the 20 of the 24 million population of Taiwan. When global uh, numbers come more than 777,000, US cases come more than 160,000. The second slide shows the track of cases came every day since the first case found in January 23rd in the flight from Wuhan, Hubei province of China. The red strips mean moving cases, and the green strips mean local infected cases. The table you see on the right side of this slide is the statistics made by March 20th. The third column is tested positive number per 1,000 people. Second column is cases of per 100,000 population. And the third column is the dead toll per 100. 
the lower, the better, right? You can see the two red narrows, top one is Taiwan, and lower one is US. This table is made by Dr. Chen Jianren. He is the PhD of John Hopkins, uh, medical and public health, and also vice president of Taiwan now. Uh, please uh, go to the slide three. Let's go, uh, let's go to slide three to find uh, the answer of why Taiwan can make this. Here is the timeline when, uh, which shows the important measurements Taiwan did. On last December 17th, the third case of Wuhan, of Wuhan uh, was unveiled. December 31st, Taiwan started an envoy checking to every plane from Wuhan and found the first move in case on January 23rd, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020. It's the same day, US also has the first case, same day. Huh? When the National uh, Command Center set up, for unifying orders for the coming outbreak on January 20th. It's one day earlier than the third case found. Moving earlier is very crucial since right judgment of the circumstance and the prevent deployments were made. February 6, Taiwan closed the border to China with five cases moving that day. It's four days later than US. Okay, let's go back to the second slide. You can see when case stopped coming temporarily since February 10th, with spare capacity, Taiwan health officials, officials started to survey all not flu cause pneumonia, then found a cab driver test, tested positive from 113 patients in whole country and did the necessary measurements. This case is very crucial for blocking more local infected cases advance. Let's see those getting longer red strips on the top of this chart. They mean the second wave of moving cases, this time it, most of from Europe and US. Uh, back to slide three, please. Dealing with social panic is not less important than preventing larger outbreak. Distribution of emergency su supplies like medical masks and disinfectant alcohol become everyone's concern. Mask exporting ban was launched on January 24th when the daily producing capability was 1.8 million per day at that time. Mask rationing launched on February 6th to calm down the social panic of the shortage and the capac uh, capacity has risen up to 12 million now, after two months later. Uh, Taiwan Prime Minister Su Zhen Chang was in a funny theory, show his four back views and say, everyone has just one butt. It means no need to buy so much toilet paper. <laughs> you will see this comic uh, picture on the next slide. So the economic impact comes immediately especially for those tourist and airline business. Uh, after an emergent legislative process, people do quarantine or isolation without pay can get subsidy about, about uh, $33 uh, dollars per day. And some companies in typical also get helps. And people's normal life uh, keeps going on when a small part of school and business close or run remotely for necessary quarantine and isolation. Uh, slide four, please. So you can see the comic picture I mentioned about toilet paper at the bottom right. It's our prime minister's uh, bald head. Uh, he's shaking his butt. And the other three pictures are about free media and crystal information. Uh, this, this man on the top left is our minister of health and welfare. Uh, Mr. Chen, he, he holds a, a media conference every day, sometimes twice a day, uh, like uh, Governor Goomer here, uh, to update the nearest situation and answer every question media journalists ask. Uh, I will back to the free media later. Please go to slide five. Let's talk about uh, mask a little more. Uh, you can see near everyone is wearing mask on street. 
and people are staying in queue for getting uh, their uh, ration mask. Rationing use usually happen in war, and however, no one can deny that it is a real war when we face the virus. A special thing I want to share is about this uh, digital mask ma map made by good at 80 citizens who uh, collaborate with this uh, 39 years old LGBT cabinet uh, member Tang Feng, the middle picture. She never went to school since uh, she was teen and she decided to be a girl in physical mail. And she and her friends made a G0V association. Uh, it looked like the GOV, right? It's kind of cultural jamming action. And the association criticized uh, Taiwan's government, uh, no crystallization. Then she was invited to join the cabinet and became the youngest uh, minister in it. And she grabbed a lot of media shots, especially international media, during these two months. At the middle lower is Diamond Princess cruise ship which has more than 700 confirmed cases in the end uh, from its uh, 2694 passenger. It was stuck uh, northern Taiwan on January 31st. Most of passenger went ashore for one day trip. Taiwan government uh, then announced this map to remind everyone had been there to stay cautious. Uh, slide six, please. In the interest of so time, you uh, might want to sum up the main points in the uh, next slides. There are five points inducted. Point one. For geographic and historical reason, Taiwan is always under caution. You can see the photos left upper one is earthquake, lower one is typhoon, and the right button is China fighter surrounding above Taiwan. They come even often after the outbreak. That's why Taiwanese people always react fast when crisis come. Point two, Taiwan know China very well, also learn experiences from SARS in 2003. Therefore could do the right judgment and act soon in the very beginning. Point three, the fully covered health insurance become the strong basic facility to control the outbreak. More than 9,900 percent people of Taiwan covered by this public run health insurance monthly payment less than $40 per person and the virus test is free under doctor's instruction so the sufficient data can be used to trace all medical treatments which mean to trace the virus. By the data also Taiwan launched a pharmacist dispensing mask ration three a week per person. Now they can buy their ration mask online too. Uh, slide seven please. And we comes to the point four, crystallized and fully authorized experts commanding system makes high efficiency. The co-members of the command center with the supporting expert team are, well, are all well medical trained, including a vice president, a deputy prime minister, a minister, and many public health or medical professor. You can see photo on the upper right is the Vice President Chen Jianren, the man with a PhD um, degree of John Hopkins. Upper left is Minister Chen, the media, uh, the media conference guy with a professor. And lower left is a Deputy Prime Minister. He was also a doctor. Uh, point five, last but not least, Three free media and plenty of quality information that people will inform and panic reduce. Taiwan is one of the country in Asia who has most of uh, uh, press freedom. If you check the press freedom index of uh, reporter without borders, the 2018 ranking of Taiwan is um, second is four is 40 seconds next to Asia number one South Korea's uh, 43rd when US is 48. Quality and responsible reporting from various free media helps people under crisis to do the uh, correct measurements and remind the, their public morality with the social healing influence at the same time. Uh, slide eight. Before the end, I want to say nothing is perfect. We want to trace the virus, which means we have to trace people. Therefore, here comes the private, 
privacy right issue. The pandemic also provoked the subtle and obscure uh, ban uh, boundary between individual uh, liberty and public interest, which feedbacks uh, individual goods. Most of the uh, opinions support to strengthen measurements for the uh, outbreak. When some critics challenge governments doing, including using personal health insurance data to do mask rationing, tracing the people had traveled overseas or had contact with positive cases who should quarantine themselves but might not do so. Human rights NGOs in Taiwan are launching campaign for legislative action, uh, action to clarify an emergent usage limitation of governmental power expanding. The red bar on the slide linked to the article written by the chairman of Taiwan Association for Human Rights. Uh, you don't have to open it, and and he is a lawyer, and because it's in Chinese, and so we just not going to see it. Uh, he is a lawyer. The, the author is a lawyer, and also a good uh, friends of mine. So I'm very sure that some people in Taiwan paid a concern to the human rights issue for the outbreak uh, doing. In a democracy like US or Taiwan, with free press and information openness, every public issue is debatable. However, under the debating and social dialogues, our democracy is going to set up deeper and stronger. That's what I believe. Now is the last uh, slide. Uh, I released a quote on March uh, 21st, the New York Times. It say, you can contain cluster you need to identify and stop discrete outbreaks and then do rigorous content, uh, con uh, contact tracing. Uh, easier say than Done, though. Doing so takes intelligent, rapidly adaptive work by health officials and near total cooperation from the populace. It's quite a description of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So preventing uh, preving of the outbreak and advanced deployments and expert leading United Command Center with laboratory level accurate cases tracking digital power the data by fully covered health insurance, and most of all, the hearty cooperation from well-informed and suspecting populace are all crucial points which make Taiwan among the best of dealing with this outbreak. A successful epidemic prevention needs to include social individual pers perspective, while master in public health medical expertise and many necessary technology. When the second outbreak peak is going to arrive with the moving in cases from Western country, Taiwan are standing still just like it always does in all kinds of tribulation. Uh, this is our presentation. Thank you. Uh, this is my presentation. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Cho. Uh, Dr. Julio Pugliese spe specializes in the politics, both domestic and international, of the Asia Pacific, with a focus on Japan, China, and the United States. Uh, he has presented at a variety of venues and published articles contributing chapters concerning academic, policy-oriented, and commercial themes in Italy, the United States, and Japan. Uh, so, uh, Julio, if you wouldn't mind taking it away. Great. Uh, thanks for having me. I'll be very quick. I only have three slides. So. Um, I will uh, <clears throat> speak about the Italian case um, uh, to make two clarion calls to the United States. Uh, the first one is a call for action uh, domestically, and the other one is a call for leadership externally. Um, and it actually has to do also with East Asia, and I'll try to also bring East Asia more often than not, in the very short presentation. Um, the Italian case, as you know, is um, um, the uh, uh, worst bearing in terms of, uh, of deaths, uh, because the virus, the coronavirus, has taken a heavy, a heavy toll uh, of uh, our uh, uh, healthcare system, which actually is uh, the best healthcare system is in the north, and it's very high, highly regarded um, according to WHO standards. Uh, um, and this has happened because we uh, have been overwhelmed. Uh, the Italian case is, is, is a clarion call to the US, um, in my opinion, uh, because we have been the first uh, Western liberal democracy 
uh, to be affected by this, uh, this virus. And this is important because uh, in East Asia, as made clear earlier, um, China, Taiwan, South Korea um, have dealt already with uh, coronaviruses in the past. And so there has been, a, if you want, also a, a chance uh, to take uh, a stock and lesson from previous experience. And this has been the case for SARS. This has been the case for MERS. Uh, and experience does matter a lot, especially when you're dealing with a crisis that is, has been hitting us uh, hard, uh, um, the worst crisis arguably since World War II. And the other difference that I see <clears throat> that uh, is a clarion call for uh, uh, other European countries, but also the United States, uh, is the fact that the social norms are very different. Uh, um, Italy has a peculiar case of having multi-generational households within one roof or within a condominium, and so there is a very strong uh, um, facility to get uh, social contact. And this actually uh, spreads uh, then also um, the epidemic uh, within communities. But there are also other social norms. Uh, there is a relative, um, as mentioned earlier, uh, um, a patient-centered uh, and individual-centered attention to healthcare or uh, to, to, to also to human rights uh, rather than a community-centered uh, uh, approach, which is typical of Confucian in, East, in Northeast Asia. Not necessarily just about, it's not, this is not necessarily just true about uh, China and uh, autocratic regimes. Um, and the other thing that is important is that, of course, we don't have the same culture of wearing masks uh, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, of keeping social distance. Uh, we are uh, blabbing Italians uh, that uh, uh, release lots of droplets uh, <laughs> and hugs, uh, and that, uh, that also doesn't help. Um, but <clears throat> to, be, to keep it serious, uh, Italy has tried to play a balancing act uh, as the first Western uh, liberal democracy in trying to cope with a new, uh, new emergency, trying to figure out really uh, how to balance uh, uh, not just uh, uh, a health and safety and uh, security problem that was underestimated uh, with economic uh, and political considerations, because that's the other trade-off uh, that we need to take into account. Italy is not a Marxist, it's not a Leninist uh, uh, dictatorship, um, <clears throat> and it's very uh, hard to enforce unprecedented uh, uh, lockdowns uh, um, from the top down. These uh, countermeasures uh, uh, that we are experiencing also in the United States and that have, Italy has experienced already um, are unprecedented. Uh, they essentially, uh, you have to go back down, you have to go uh, back to history to the Second World War to see something like this happening. And this uh, politically is incredibly hard to, um, to enact, especially if you're the first country. Uh, and uh, it's not crystal clear uh, uh, the dangers uh, in terms of uh, the health and safety of your citizens that you're going to incur. And so it's going to be a very tough political choice uh, uh, to make. Um, and, and that's why you've seen a lot of dithering uh, and why you see uh, uh, the many deaths that we have, uh, we have now in the country. And you shouldn't forget that Italy has been then the first uh, uh, Western liberal democracy to enforce uh, then a lockdown. A lockdown that is very harsh and it's uh, uh, statewide, nation statewide. And um, you know, we have essentially constituted a role model to other European countries that have enforced uh, uh, similar lockdowns of equal uh, entity. Um, uh, and we are getting there uh, uh, slowly but steadily, uh, at least within the states, uh, thanks to state authorities in the United States of America. But <clears throat> I'll skip this slide uh, uh, for the sake of, uh, um, of, 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 uh, uh, of being uh, succinct. Uh, I think what you need to know is the difference between a mitigation strategy that has been in place at the beginning. You've seen this in Italy. You've seen this in the UK, you've seen this, you are seeing this still in the United States of America. Uh, and a, miti a mitigation uh, strategy uh, aims at essentially at slowing down the spread uh, through moral suasion uh, campaigns and through uh, uh, watered down uh, lockdowns. Um, this uh, is also reinforced by 
the divide between uh, central authorities and local authorities, the fact that uh, uh, there is a politicization of these, uh, of, these, of these matters. You see it, for instance, in the difference responses that you see uh, in New York State or the ones that you see um, in Mississippi. Um, I'm talking about the state of Mississippi. Um, and the dithering, the dithering, the dithering uh, and uh, the lack of decisive action uh, allows uh, for more and more spread and the potential for domino effect. So I would go back to the presentation made earlier. I think that there needs to be a coordinated and aggressive action that preempts the risk. But this has been already too late, even in the United States of America. As you know, the peak will be reached, uh, according to um, uh, Dr. Fauci, in two weeks, the peak of deaths in the United States. And so the picture is not very rosy. And there needs to be a much more coordinated and much more sort of uh, aggressive approach that takes stock also of positive and negative examples around the world. And for better or for worse, uh, um, for also for sheer bad luck, uh, uh, Italy is able to provide many of those uh, uh, virtuous and uh, negative examples to, to, to the United States of America. Now, to, to conclude, I think what is fascinating, and it has been touched upon earlier, is that Italy has been at the forefront uh, um, uh, because of the <clears throat> large death toll that has uh, taken place in the country. And uh, uh, by virtue of uh, uh, being uh, um, being at the center of this pand global pandemic as we speak. Uh, it has also been at the very center of uh, um, a series of uh, uh, diploma uh, of medical uh, help diplomacy, so to speak, uh, that is also uh, a byproduct uh, of the turbulent times uh, uh, we're living in. Uh, China has been very um, uh, prompt in uh, um, lending its hand uh, through medical equipment. Um, some of it uh, was, uh, such as masks and protective gears, uh, were uh, donated, also by uh, Huawei, for instance, a Chinese company. And uh, the rest of it was uh, uh, sold, such as ventilators, because China, of course, has a surplus right now and has also a business interest in selling them. But it's good that Italy got uh, help from every corner including by buying ventilators from China, because we're witnessing an emergency. And, uh, and emergencies don't look at uh, geopolitical games of uh, who scores points and calling this a bioweapon. And this has been the line, for instance, from the spokesperson of the Chinese uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He has labeled this a US uh, bioweapon. Or uh, the US government labeling this uh, the Chinese uh, uh, virus uh, or the Wuhan virus or a senator calling it a, a, a Chinese bioweapon. This is unhelpful in the face of global pandemic. And this uh, actually speaks wonders about uh, the problems that uh, we are experiencing in terms of US-China relations going down the drain. Um, because uh, make no mistake, Italy and many other countries in Europe, and now Europe is the epicenter, are witnessing uh, the biggest crisis since World War II. And uh, what will happen now in terms of uh, uh, external support uh, um, and uh, who is going to help uh, uh, friends in need uh, will be remembered for a long time because this is a critical juncture. And I suspect, uh, in fact, uh, uh, and we are seeing this already from uh, with leaks from Downing Street uh, in the UK, that uh, politicians are already blaming China for this. And so uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, of heavy lifting that China has to do in terms of, you know, <clears throat> making up uh, for the very uh, uh, slow um, uh, covered up uh, initial response that also went through a feckless uh, WHO um, uh, 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 response uh, because the WHO specifically the director general um, was uh, <clears throat> reportedly under strong influence from, uh, uh, from China. And so there was an interest on the Chinese side to quiet things down also because China was trying to grapple with balancing economic uh, uh, and international political uh, necessities uh, with the global pandemic. And unfortunately, uh, it squandered uh, its, its initial response before the lockdown and uh, 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 
the uh, uh, people's war, as uh, has been mentioned earlier. And uh, I'm afraid that this um, is, uh, um, is a weakness uh, and it's uh, a responsibility that is very, it's crystal clear to American policymakers and they're trying to emphasize uh, the Chinese and the um, origins of the virus also to score political points in that regard. Um, and I'm afraid that uh, <clears throat> the US response has been underwhelming. The US would be better uh, equipped uh, in responding to this at the international stage uh, by constructive example and through cooperation, not by finger pointing. Um, and we're seeing a bit of this. Uh, Trump uh, today has announced uh, aid uh, of ventilators as well, which have been that which the US now is producing through the Defense Production Act uh, to European countries. Mm, the equipment promised uh, to Italy is uh, around 100 million. I think uh, the, this, uh, this stuff is uh, um, uh, part of uh, a donation, uh, but don't count me on that because Trump is famous for contradicting himself. And uh, the US has announced that it will also uh, uh, help out France and Spain. Um, I think that uh, the best thing uh, to take stock of is that we should uh, uh, really get ourselves together and, and try to cooperate in the face of uh, this global crisis uh, and, uh, and be particularly uh, wary also of the careful of the day of, 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 of the tricky balancing act that democracies, uh, Western democracies have to enact. Uh, uh, because it's very hard, for instance, to enforce uh, measures similar to South Korea. And from what I understand, uh, correct me if I'm mistaken, mistaken also in um, Taiwan, not to mention China, of course, which is an autocracy, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the capillary use uh, of the social media and uh, technology, uh, new technologies, uh, to get hold of private uh, citizens' uh, data, that is something that is a very hard thing to do. Um, at, the, at the moment. You need uh, legislation, you need uh, uh, a Patriot Act, if you want, uh, uh, that uh, allows uh, a central government to essentially uh, get hold of um, your um, personal information uh, for the higher, um, for the higher, uh, uh, the higher moral ground of saving lives. But it has to be done in the right way and in the sort of limited window of the crisis. And this is why uh, I think that Western Europe, uh, European countries uh, and the United States uh, are witnessing a different approach from uh, uh, East Asian countries, as we, the, the ones we, I mentioned, uh, and of course uh, with, uh, with autocratic China. And I think uh, that's uh, the, uh, the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Giulio. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, because we are already a little bit over, and thank you so much to those who are sticking around, I wanted to open it up for a couple questions that we have uh, recorded from our group chats. And uh, how I would like to do this, uh, we have two questions that are uh, applicable for all the speakers. Uh, so when I ask each question, if uh, each speaker wouldn't mind uh, giving a two minute, no more than two minute, and I will time you, uh, answer to each of the questions. And we can just start in the order of presentations. So we'll go with Huang first, followed by Qingyun, followed by Yi, followed by Julia. Uh, so the uh, first question, uh, it was originally phrased as, uh, what are the prospects for Taiwan's entry into the WHO given its stellar handling of the COVID-19 crisis? But to extend that out, uh, for all speakers, what do you think uh, has been the uh, effect, positive or negative, with uh, WHO and international organization involvement? I think uh, uh, this is a very controversial uh, topic. You know, uh, mainland China's bottom line is Taiwan is a inseparable part of um, of China. So for WHO and international organization, um, the condition to join into international organization is you have to be a country with the sovereignty. So uh, I think, I guess for WHO, so Taiwan is not entitled uh, with the, uh, you know, the condition to join WHO. But on the other hand, from a humanitarian perspective, 
Taiwan is entitled to be informed by the WHO information because this is and also Taiwan is also one of the one of the important uh, significant member of the international community. So Taiwan is also entitled to you know share its information, its valuable experience with the world. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we're just gonna. Uh, running all over time, so just going to pass on the mic, but thank you for your input. Uh, Ching Yun Li, please, if you have a quick moment. Mm, yeah, I think it's also a debate uh, difficult to approach because Taiwan's position to uh, China mainland, so it's uh, it's hard to uh, hard to approach if not as a, uh, if it's a position now, it's just uh, difficult to approach to uh, WHO. Mm, thank think. you. Uh, Eve? Yeah, I thank you for the question. I'm more than happy to reply. Uh, Taiwan is excluded by nearly every international organization uh, because of China's boycott, not just WHO. So without exception in WHO, uh, we are basically on our own in this uh, virus battle, you know. But uh, we does have, uh, we, we have some uh, cooperation with the United States in vaccine and medical research uh, perspective. Uh, WHO's doing are uh, less impressive this time, actually. Uh, it is disappointed and losing its leadership in the global public uh, health uh, field. Mm. If, if you look at what they have done, anything to help uh, so many countries, you can tell. I can say Taiwan want to join WHO to get more information and resources, especially in a glo global pandemic like this. And we also like to share our experiences through SARS to this uh, uh, novel, uh, novel cro coronavirus. We would like to help even we are not allowed to get in now, uh, but we can help more if we are getting, we are included. So yeah. we deeply need support from you and from the war. Great, thank you. And uh, Julio, your thoughts? And if you wanted also to, you mentioned before about uh, generally what WHO was doing, if you had a quick comment on uh, international uh, cooperation or efforts. Sure, I think the um, <clears throat> response by the WHO has been feckless, actually has been pathetic. Um, one of the reasons <clears throat> Is, uh, um, is because of the effective politicization of uh, the WHO. The head of the, the director general of the WHO is a, um, an Ethiopian politician who used to be uh, minister of foreign affairs for his country. And Ethiopia has a uh, very strong <clears throat> uh, economic uh, link with China to the extent that it depends, uh, it depends a lot on Chinese largesse and donations and whatnot. And so there is a political uh, economic link that has facilitated uh, uh, the WHO uh, closing a blind eye, closing, yeah, closing an eye on what was going on at the beginning. And so, for instance, uh, as, uh, as late as um, uh, January 20, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the WHO was still tweeting, and you can like go and uh, look it up online, um, that there are no proofs that uh, the, co the novel coronavirus um, was easily spread um, um, uh, between humans. So they, that, that, is, um, that, that is clearly uh, also speaks uh, wonders about uh, how this will impact not just the way we deal with specific countries, but also how we will look at international organizations. Now is not the time for this kind of, uh, um, of debates, uh, I imagine. I think that we now really have to care about the uh, emergency, but make no mistake, once the dust settles, we will uh, talk a lot about uh, the responsibilities uh, of each and every one of us, including uh, international organizations. Great, thank you. And then to uh, close us up uh, with the last question, and actually this comes from uh, Huang's presentation, if each of you could give a uh, one to two sentence answer, uh, how do you think that the COVID-19 spread will reshape the world? Uh, Huang, if you wouldn't mind uh, offering your thoughts on that. Uh, actually, there are different views 
uh, different views of this uh, question, different uh, experts, uh, scholars d express different perspectives for this question. Some people will, okay, they will be a more closed up of this internationalization of the world. Countries will be more engrossed by themselves uh, to dealing with their own problems while not sharing too much duties or, or obligations or stuff, you know, in the international range, but uh, but there there are also you know analysis that okay now you know human beings now actually from experienced SARS from the coronavirus climate change H one N O all kinds of this cross borders crisis international crisis so human beings are now unprecedented connected one that's what we Chinese people say a uh, humankind so this world has to face like a more like a we have to share a more global responsibility like a cooperation unprecedented cooperation with each other than ever before so I think mm. uh, uh, there are like a two uh, trends uh, with uh, like the, how this coronavirus or this kind of crisis will reshape our world and also it's very interesting observe that the, the different, I mean, the balancing, the, sh the, the shifting, the balance, balancing of uh, like the uh, status of uh, powers in the world, like America, European Union, uh, their uh, adjustment or their change of the like, uh, status within this global arena uh, as a global power. So it will be very, very interesting to observe this shift, this changing of the trend in the international uh, community, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, your thoughts on how COVID-19 will reshape the world? Mm, I think uh, there's a really uh, like a big chapter for the globalization. And uh, this, um, you know, uh, even before this happened uh, with the China's rising, it's already called a, uh, worldwide attention on China's rising. And now it's, yes, China can give help to other countries, but uh, as I read, uh, many countries also take the think that China try to take this good chance to to approach their, their uh, uh, China's own values or model or something like that. But uh, I would just hope people more, um, come down to see this in more uh, reasonable rational to say it's just uh, uh, globalization need more cooperation uh, than competition so that's my opinion thank mm. you thank you dr lee uh e your thoughts how yeah. covid 19 will reshape the world yeah definitely you can see what a dramatic change that uh, republican uh government uh, led by President Trump, is going to spend 1,000, uh, 1,150, uh, 100, 15, 1,500 uh, dollars to everyone, right? If uh, I'm right. So it's going to spend, dispense money to everyone directly. It's, it's amazing. I mean, it never happened or it can any, get any legitimacy before this pandemic come. Now people change, their mind have changed. So you can see what the dramatic change uh, has been happen, uh, is happening now. And uh, I think uh, talking about the international power uh, balance, uh, it also have a very, uh, we can uh, predict it going to happen, something is going to happen, something is going to happen inside uh, United States, we can see, and it's going to happen in inside China, we can see. Many observations uh, uh, mentioned about the power uh, conflicts inside the China. Now is a, a very high possibility to occur in the coming future. So we will, we will see uh, what happened then. Now those in inside countries uh, change also will uh, become or also will have interaction uh, uh, to uh, net uh, you know international powers uh, uh, have the, those re relations between 
the uh, international powers and to uh, have, uh, inter have to interact those powers relationships among them. We haven't uh, mentioned about Russia, but uh, I think Russia will take its part also. Uh, that's right. what I saw. A lot of and very huge change will coming. Mm. Thank you. Uh, and Julio, to round us off, uh, how do you think COVID-19 will reshape the world? Uh, I'll give you my uh, lecture and war studies opinion. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I think that it's getting, uh, <clears throat> it's making us all poorer. Um, and so I am, I'm, I also, uh, I'm very suspicious of people who claim that China is trying to export something with, uh, I don't know, how would you call it? Uh, influenza operation, you know, if it's not influence, it's influenza. So no, I think that's, uh, that's a bit, it's a bit um, uh, over the top uh, uh, claims. Uh, but um, what I think is happening is that uh, is we're going to experience a lot of disruption internally. Um, Europe uh, is already having another big stress test, uh, uh, certainly as important uh, as uh, the one that we witnessed uh, uh, following the, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> the financial crisis uh, and um, uh, the uh, Greek debt uh, that busted uh, crisis in 2008. Um, uh, we need to make sure that this uh, crisis turns into an opportunity uh, for deeper fiscal uh, uh, consolidation and cooperation within uh, the Europe, uh, the eurozone. Otherwise, the euro is bust. Um, one other uh, aspect that hasn't been mentioned, uh, I would follow closely because. Uh, mm, we will. Uh, we are dealing right now in the U.S. Uh, or in the U.K. Uh, and we will uh, take stock of this in the future with underwhelming responses uh, by politicians that have been warned uh, by the Italian experience. <clears throat> and the same ha actually applies to Italy. We have been slow, and we could have been uh, quicker and more resolute. Politicians uh, don't like to take uh, uh, bad credit uh, for wrong decisions. Who are they going to blame? themselves, I don't think so. They might have to blame a foreign country. Which foreign country will they blame? So I suspect that China is not in a very good position uh, if, uh, um, if uh, you know, if we don't get, uh, if we don't pull ourselves together and really try to cooperate. Uh, it might be the case uh, that uh, there's going to be more and more blame placed on China. And this will actually reinforce uh, uh, the decoupling or uh, whatever you want to call it, tensions uh, uh, between countries and, uh, and, and in China. I, 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 I imagine this scenario playing out in the United States, especially as we're nearing a presidential election. China is going to become the boogeyman. That's my, my short-term prediction. Great. Well, thank you all very much for your uh, answers to those questions. Sorry if we couldn't get to a question. We want to value all your time, especially as some folks here on the East Coast, it's uh, in the evening too. And everyone can say goodbye to the speakers too. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for all the speakers too, for uh, lending their expertise and answering our uh, questions with points.